and thank you for having me. This is, a, this is the first time I've given a lot of lectures, but it's the first time I've given a talk at the Pope's Palace, so a beautiful uh, venue. Thank you. So I'm going to share my perspective on uh, sleep apnea surgery with you. Um, some of you may know that I spent uh, many, many years with uh, Christian Giminol. In fact, we ran a joint clinic together for over 20 years, so I spent a lot of time with them. I learned not just uh, sleep medicine, but also a lot about the French. A couple of things stood out. Number one, the French are br brilliant. Okay, French are brilliant people. Uh, the, the second thing is that the French never agreed on anything. And, and they, they love to argue. So I look forward to a lot of arguments and disagreements uh, to my talk uh, at the end. But remember, I was trained by a Frenchman, so I hit back. Okay. So, to me, any time that you're going to treat patients, whatever you do for them has to make physiologic, physiologic sense. Okay? We know physiology, it's, it's irrefutable. So, it has to make sense, number one. Number two, you should have supporting data in terms of what you're doing for them. But also, ideally, you should have some physical evidence that, validate, that validates the data. Okay, so let's take a look at some physical evidence. This is a patient, 60-year-old woman, postmenopausal, moderate sleep apnea, significant amount of nasal obstruction, and uh, has fairly advanced periodontal disease that you can see. Now, these spaces were created by someone who told her that the extractions of her premolars during childhood for orthodontia caused her sleep apnea. And what's even more idiotic is that this person told her that by recreating the extraction sockets and placed dental implants, that it is going to improve her sleep apnea. Uh, Christian would say, it's a catastrophe, okay? So, fortunately, during the treatment, she realizes that it did nothing to improve her. So she stopped and seek an orthodontist. This orthodontist actually does a lot of expansion, very well known, and told her that, uh, you know, you're, we need to do jaw surgery, so send her to a jaw surgeon. Of course, you get send someone to a jaw surgeon, guess what you're going to get? Jaw surgery. The patient came to see me. I was looking for a second opinion. I said, well, you know, you can have jaw surgery. I don't think that would be my first choice. You must improve your nasal breathing. You know, and I think that that's always the basis of good breathing, and uh, you can potentially improve your ability to tolerate the CPAP, and you may not need a, a much bigger operation. The patient went back to the orthodontist and told uh, the orthodontist that Dr. Lee said, I should be expanded and fix my nose. The orthodontist said, well, only if Dr. Lee promises that he's not going to mess up your teeth. So I expanded her. You can see that it's a skeletal expansion, small diastema, but the key of expansion is skeletal expansion, right? 60-year-old, significant periodontal disease, you can see that it's a pure skeletal expansion. It can be done through and through ANS and PNS expansion on a 60-year-old with severe periodontal disease. Okay, so I straightened her nasal septum as well. And she's breathing much better using CPAP much better, actually stopped using CPAP. But she still wanted to get, you know, improve her aesthetics and improve her occlusion. So she asked me to do her jaw surgery because she had a good result from the expansion. Whenever I do jaw surgery, whenever I treatment plan a patient nowadays with, with VSP, I always do two treatment plans. One is sort of focused on facial aesthetics. Different people have different sort of motivation in terms of getting surgery. So one treatment plan is usually focused on improvement of facial aesthetics. Second is to maximize airway improvement. Now, over the years, I've been doing this surgery for a long time. Over the years, people, patients usually come in and say, well, you know, I don't care how I look. I'm so miserable. I want you to improve me as much as possible, okay? Once they sleep better, they're going to care about the way they look, okay? Everybody cares about the way they look. So the treatment plan, you know, that I do for sleep apnea, it doesn't mean that I'm going to make everyone look like a monkey, okay? But you have to take that into consideration. So 
she elected for plan number two. It's a lengthy discussion, okay, between surgeon and patient. So you can see she had about an 18 millimeter mandibular advancement uh, with some counterclockwise rotation. We won't go, to the, um, go into the detail of the surgery. So as you know, improved skeletal support is going to uh, improve the, uh, the appearance. Uh, you can see that she looks younger, she's happier, and she, had, she was very happy with the result. So this is subjectively what she felt. Just the expansion of the nasal surgery eliminated the need of CPAP, okay? And this happens, I've done a lot of expansion in patients with, uh, who are treating, who's been treated with CPAP, and every patient had to reduce their CPAP pressure. Over time, as many of them eliminated the need of CPAP, waking up better, feeling better, blah, blah, blah. And with the MMA, further improvement of breathing and sleep, okay? So, good result, she's happy. Second patient, very successful professional, moderate sleep apnea, very tired, significant fatigue, and can't breathe his no through his nose as, as well. Went on a state, saw an orthodontist. By the way, some of these photos or, or slides are photos given to me by the patient. So they may not be the most clear, but it tells a story. Had MSE, SFOT, Invisalign, I cannot understand why that was done, but anyway, so created diastema, no skeletal expansion. Okay, let's do it again. No, fail. So just because you have a diastema doesn't mean that there's skeletal expansion, okay? And patient had no improvement, okay? There you can see all it did with the MSE was, I know these are fighting words now, was the AGA movement, <laughs> okay? Flaring teeth out, Burning the buckle bone while not doing anything. Four screws, not enough. Let's do six screws, okay? Six screws, no expansion. So this patient was deemed unable to be expanded. MMA surgery, okay? The MMA surgery was successful, big advancement. The patient was still symptomatic, okay? Still can't breathe through his nose, still very tired. I said, well, <laughs> you can't breathe through your nose. The nose is basis of, of breathing. So he was expanded. This is week one. Week one to three months. You can see that it's a pure skeletal expansion. You can see, okay, well, you know, three months, a couple millimeters, what's the big deal? Okay, this is one week, three months. Pre and post, at three months, he's still expanding. Now, when I expand patients, they do it every other day, and when they're in town, they come in and I expand them. When they're out of town, out of country or whatever, they send me photos every time they expand. You can ask my wife, I'm always on my phone managing my patients. Why? Because that's not what they do. You have to always watch them, okay? So, He's a smart guy, actually in the healthcare field. He knew that the MSC just flared out his molars, right? And after three months of expansion, maybe a couple millimeter expansion, skeletally, he's able to sleep through his, with his, on his back, okay? So, subjectively, after MMA, five out of 10 fatigue, still waking up, snoring, groaning, which is catathrenia, which is symptom of sleep apnea, witness apnea. After three months of skeletal expansion, feeling better, sleeping better, et cetera, okay? So every patient sends me, every time they expand, I monitor it. And he's still expanding, I expect continual improvement. Another patient, 68 year old, moderate sleep apnea, nasal obstruction, treated by a very well, very well known orthodontist, sent her to a jaw surgeon, treatment plan was jaw surgery, came to see me because her sleep physician was a little skeptical. He says, you know, you should be treated with nasal CPAP. I said, I agree. You know, I don't think jaw surgery should be your first option. I said, you need to be expanded because she couldn't breathe through her nose. I expanded her. You can see that she has a tiny diastema, very small jaw, 68 year old. By the way, the turbinate. Turbinates, on, you're going to see a lot of CT scan. They're going to inflate or deflate or whatever. That's called the nasal cycle. It, it doesn't really relate to, 
to, ex to the expansion. But 60 AL, you can have a pure skeletal expansion, okay? And like, like the first patient, so basically, after, this is six months, after six months skeletal expansion. She's very narrow, no more room for the, for the distractor. Under local anesthesia, I reposition it for further expansion. No, there's no additional charge, okay? I get the patient to the, to the finish line. You can see pre, six months, and after the replacement uh, or reposition of the distractor. 68-year-old, ANS to PNS, okay? Now, in six months, we're able to drop the CPAP pressure from seven, uh, between seven to 11 to four to five. Four is room air. Probably half of the CPAP pressure that's needed is to get the air through the nose, okay? So, you know, a lot of times I do expansion to improve patients' CPAP tolerance, not necessarily to try to eliminate the CPAP. Now, if we're gonna treat sleep apnea, we have to understand the physiology, okay? So we breathe by negative, negative pressure. We expand our lungs, we suck the air through the nose, down the, or in the mouth, down the throat, into the, into the lungs. That's how we breathe. As we breathe by how, like how we drink, okay? The airway, the upper airway, is basically the straw, a compliant straw, okay? So when the airway is a bit small, or sleep apnea, you're gonna increase your effort, therefore it's gonna you know, constrict the upper airway. Repetitive airway sort of restriction is gonna damage the upper airway. Now this patient is a classic patient with severe sleep apnea. Over time, the soft palace of uh, injured and, and damaged are really destroyed, and sleep apnea is gonna get worse because these tissues become more and more compliant, more and more obstructive. And there's plenty of evidence suggesting that there's upper airway injury, the soft tissue injury from sleep apnea, and causes gradual worsening of sleep apnea. Nothing, you know, I tell patients, it happens to the best of us. The sleep apnea is always going to progress. It doesn't matter. No, you cannot uh, predict how fast or how severe it's going to progress, but it is going to progress. Okay? And the prevalence of sleep apnea increases as we age. And in women, especially menopause, okay? When you lose the hormones, the airway becomes uh, much more floppy. So I like to look at the airway as a holistic structure, okay? Because it, it is, the entire tube is affected. And the operation to improve the entire airway is, is the MMA, and I've done a lot of them. I like to show these two slides to, just to point out that patients come in all shapes, different shapes and sizes, okay? It's, it's great for, for a surgeon to show, you know, someone with significant maximum mandibular deficiency, you do a big counterclockwise rotation, advancement, looks great, patient's great, airway's great. But even patients with class three malocclusion, prognathic mandible, can still have sleep apnea. I've treated them all the time. So in this patient, the surgical maneuver really is a significant maxillary advancement, right? And so you have the treatment plan your patients, you know, um, individualize to try to not compromise the airway when you're really considering the facial aesthetics, but really to maximize airway improvement. The, uh, I published uh, my 25-year uh, data, about 1,000 patients. The, the key take-home is that, you know, often these patients have, usually have significant sleep apnea, but the key take-home is that, you know, the success rate to really get them down to RDI less than 20 is about 70-some percent. It is not 90 percent, what a lot of people, a lot of surgeons like to tell you. If you look at all comers, you know, is 73%, 77% is not bad, but it's not 100%, okay? And what are the, pro what are the, uh, the favorable prognostic factors? It's pretty typical. Younger patients who are not overweight, less severe sleep apnea, large advancements, okay? Large advancements. You want to maximize the airway improvement. And, you know, before sort of start looking at the data, I already knew Right? When you treat patients, you want to learn from your experience. So if you really take a look at the first 500 first versus the last 500, yeah, I'm picking out less younger patients, less severe, okay, less overweight, and yes, the success rate improves with patient selection. That's, it's all about patient selection.
Okay. But the problem is that, you know, in my entire career, I see second opinions. Patients come in to see me. They had jaw surgery for their sleep apnea. They were advanced three millimeters, two millimeters, okay? Movements to improve aesthetics, but compromise, not really improving the airway. And the, we, in dental school or, or through our training, we're taught about normal cephalometric landmark. Okay, normal cephalometric landmark does not equate good airway, does not equate no sleep apnea. Okay, I look at jaw surgery as a conduit to improve the patient's airway and sleep apnea. And obviously you have to take account into the aesthetics. You know, normal aesthetic, normal cephalometric measurements do not equate beauty. It's really the soft tissue covering of the skeleton. It's, it's well demonstrated in the literature that you know, normal CEPH measurements th does not mean that it's aesthetic. Okay? Even today, very frequently, every month, patients come in to see me that had jaw surgery. This, was just ha uh, this patient came in to see me. He had five operations. MMA was his last resort. He was advanced two, three millimeters. He's on my schedule in September for revision MMA. This patient, young woman, goes to Ivy League University, quit school because she was so fatigued. Had MMA, had a three, four millimeter advancement, came in to see me two months later, still fatigued, okay? So when you do an, an operation, I think it's important when you work with your surgeons, you obviously are involved. You want to work as a team to really consider what is the indication for surgery. I see a lot of patients that come in that have surgery that did not have the most favorable outcome. Sometimes I see what I call repeat offenders. Yes, this patient has a prognathic mandible or class 3 malocclusion, but when you do surgical maneuvers that's completely obliterating the airway, you're going to cause breathing problem and sleep problems. I know you think I may be exaggerating, these are just a, a, a few emails that I get from patients after their jaw surgery. They're not my patients, okay? Can't swallow, not enough advancement. When can I have MMA surgery again? <laughs> Botch surgery. Now, these patients' lives were changed, not for the better, okay? Open bite and et cetera. So treatment planning during MMA is for MMA is very important. You have to consider the airway. Even if you have a good MMA, it doesn't remember, sleep apnea is always going to progress as we age, okay? That's really an important take home message. What else can we do for our patients? I've done a lot of expansion in my career. I should for many, many years, okay? Many years ago, I should think, I'm gonna enlarge this patient's mouth. Okay, I'm going to create a huge mouth to increase the intraoral volume. That, I'm going to improve the tongue position, et cetera. So I published on that 20 years ago, okay? It's kind of funny that a patient came in to see me at last month saying, I watched this YouTube video of someone who is expanding the upper lower jaw as the new frontier of the treatments of sleep apnea. Said, yeah, it's about 20 years new. Okay, that just tells me that some people don't read the literature. So I've done about 30 cases over the years. I was very selective, okay? So you can see these people had 15, 18, 20 millimeter maximum mandibular expansion. Look at how, how much room I was creating. I used to, you know, I was young, I used to be so proud of myself, okay, that I could create someone from here to here. In an adult, create so much room for the tongue and that their sleep apnea was gonna be better, okay, in male. Look at how the facial changes. Huge widening of the maxilla mandible, huge chin after expansion. In women, in kids, after about 30 cases, I stopped doing them. Why? Because I wasn't happy with the results. These people have huge mouth, but you know, sometimes their sleep apnea is improved, sometimes not improved. These people have to, have to go through, you know, distraction and all this stuff. They have to go through a lot. This kid, who I expanded, ended up doing MMA on him at age 17. 
I don't want to do a bunch of surgery on the same patient. So let's go back, okay? Let's look, look, look at physiology. We breathe, we were born as obligatory nasal breathers. We want to breathe through our nose. That's the most efficient way of breathing. We breathe through our mouth to compensate when we can't breathe enough, get enough air through our nose. And when we breathe through our mouth, the mouth's got to open, number one. Number two, the tongue has to sit lower to get a pathway for the air to go in. While this piece of steak, which is called the tongue, it's got to go somewhere, right? Um, it's going to retro-displace a little, okay? And it's going to narrow the airway a little. And when you're asleep, when you're mouth breathing, your brainstem is going to say, hey, you need to increase your effort to breathe a little bit more because I want the same amount of air, right? So I don't care how big your mouth is, okay? <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's the nose. It's always been the nose. And there's plenty of evidence suggesting that improvement in nasal breathing improves sleep apnea, improves sort of air, um, upper airway resistance, and um, if you block the nose, you can induce sleep apnea in healthy volunteers, okay? So, the key of maxillary expansion is to expand the nose, period, okay? And the it's to improve airway resistance. So, and the resistance is to the fourth power of the radius. You don't have to exp expand someone 15 millimeters. You can see those examples that I gave you. Couple three millimeters, you see, I'm seeing dramatic clinical response, okay? And there's a lot of pediatric literature from, from the pediatric expansion, and, and you know, it's been, it's been worked out. The key is nasal airway improvement. And in order to improve the nasal airway, you gotta split the sutures, okay? So, why wasn't I so successful? Because the pattern of surgical expansion with I call it a SARPI, you could call it a dome, whatever it is, it's the same thing with the addition of a few screws, okay? It's a method of widening the jaw, not a method to really maximize of widening the nose, okay? Foggy, but it, it's unclear, but it's not my slides. But let me, let's look at some examples. 37-year-old, moderate sleep apnea, very symptomatic, can't breathe through his nose. He was actually treated by the orthodontist of the first, uh, of the first patient. He had dome and SFOT. Okay, so you can see that diasma is created. Now, anybody could use a saw, okay, but look at the way the cut was made. You make a cut like this, you ex what do you expect? And you apply force on the molars. What's it gonna do? It's going to do this, right? It's not gonna do that because the angle of the cut, okay? So all the patient did was basically resulted in what I call the aga movement from MSC, flaring out the teeth, burning the buccal bone. You could see the largest expansion was on the teeth, no posterior expansion at all, regardless how many screws you put in. Now, I've done SFOT as well for patients. To me, there are two indications for SFOT. Acceleration of the teeth movement to cut, you know, treat the bone so the teeth move faster, and augmentation, right? So the reason for the SFOT for patients that are going, to, going through expansion, I don't think it's to accelerate it, it's to augment the buccal bone that you're burning, <laughs> okay? It's a consequence of bad expansion. Another patient, 30-year-old moderate sleep apnea, can't breathe through his nose, came to see me. He already had the dome expansion. Look at how wide his jaw gotten, okay? And you can see that fairly significant asymmetric expansion. Had a hideous genioplasty, okay, big expansion. You can see this segment move a little bit on the right, move a little bit more, that's the result, that's why it resulted in asymmetric expansion. Okay, very little posterior expansion. Now, he came to see me, so I'm looking at him, I said, okay, well, you can't breathe through your nose, you got a real flat occlusal plane, and you got a big chin, 
So you don't have excess soft tissues. He can't use CPAP because his nose is so blocked. Okay, what are my options? I can do an MMA, so I have to reduce his chin, but he's got a real flat occlusal plane. I can't do any counterclockwise rotation. I'm gonna have to move him straight out. The aesthetic is gonna be a problem, okay? And he's got a, he doesn't show a whole lot in size or show. So my surgical movements have to do, do a little bit of clockwise rotation to give him more in size or show, right? So aesthetically, this is gonna be a challenging plan, uh, a surgical planning. So I expanded him, okay? You, now, this is about the biggest diasma that I've, been, that I've created on, on my expansion. And you can see that right side was a little bit more because he already had prior dome and that uh, it kind of slicked the, the, the anterior maxilla. But I was able to get good skeletal expansion. I was still able to open up the posterior. Um, and remember, I see, get my patients every time they expand. So his breathing's improved. And I said, you're the handful of patients, I've done a few of these cases, handful of patients that had different, know the difference between dome and ease. It's stark, okay? Why? Well, people don't wanna, people that say, oh no, this, they just don't wanna, they just don't wanna admit that it's just simple geometry. If you wanna expand the nose, you wanna expand the myth face, not just the, not just the whatever's before your Lafour cut. Okay, this was published in 2019. You can see the, uh, you know, you can see the data. Um, so, these patients were not overweight, okay, and they're not, and they're pretty young, okay, they're not overweight. So, careful patient selection. I know there are other ways to expand, okay, what I call dental expansion. <laughs> I'm being kind of sarcastic, okay. There's the AGA. AGA has been in the news, right? Okay, if look up CBS investigation, destroy a lot of lives. Okay, there's the AGA flaring out the teeth, burning the buccal bone. There's the ELF. Now I'm not going to I'm not going to argue about pediatric. They're complete, completely different. We're talking about adults. You apply force on the on the teeth on an adult. What are you going to do? You're not going to open the suture. You're just going to flare out the teeth, burn the buccal bone. There's such thing called the Vivo's uh, DNA day night appliance. Is DNA in uh, in France yet? Very slick. You get really pretty pictures on a CT scan. They'll sell you a, an expensive CT scan. No? Congratulations. Okay. So you apply force on the t uh, you, you know more than me. <laughs> okay. And these are fighting words now. People are gonna throw bombs at me. MSE, okay? Dental alveolar expansion. Let's look at some examples. 26 year old, you're supposed to be able to do MSE on him, right? You can see the sign of MSE with some scars. Try once, nope, agot effect. Second time, nope, agot effect, okay? Four is not enough, we need more screws, okay? More screws. These are all provided to me by patients that come to see me. Guess what? They fail. They're, you're ignoring the effect of the, the, the anatomy. First, by the way, they, they have more room to put more screws there. The bone, we all have done hundreds of self tracings, right? When you go, the palate bone behind, at the first molar and, and be, posterior, it's paper thin. You can see it's translucent. The posterior bone's very thin. It's whatever screw you put back here isn't going to hold, okay? It's going to just cheese wire through it. And the posterior is the most difficult to expand, right? It's anatomy. It's physiology. Simple, three-dimensional analysis. If you're able to put open the posterior, you don't have to expand much to create a significant opening versus if you don't open the posterior, just focus on the interior, okay? Simple geometry. Some took geometry in middle school, some took it in college. <laughs> I know, I'm being sarcastic. Then look at some more examples. 20-year-old, 
First of all, this patient has severe sleep apnea, overweight. The treatment is not expansion. The treatment is CPAP. Okay, it's CPAP. That's what I see day in and day out. Patients come, oh, I had expansion, it's supposed to help my sleep apnea, and this patient's BMI is 32. I'm sorry, that's not the treatment of choice. 20-year-old, severe sleep apnea, can't breathe through his nose at all, okay? You can see MSC SFOT. I, I just cannot understand why the SF, I guess it makes the jaw bigger. AGA movement, you can see that two, four, six. Two, four, six. Flaring out the teeth. There's no scala opening. Why the patient coming to see me? Because he's not better. And the screws becoming longer in the nose. Why? Because the type of movement, you attach something on, on the molars, on the teeth, you're going to do this, and the screw is going to go into the nose more, right? It's, it's, you know more, you, don't, you know better than me in terms of vectors and movement, whatever. Six screws, no posterior opening, and no movement, no opening at all. 20 year old. How about a 24 year old? You can see the scars of the MSE, huge jaw, okay? He came in to see me, why? Because he can't breathe through his nose, and he's, still, he's symptoms of sleep apnea, moderate sleep apnea, did not change. Impressive, huh? Huge jaw, impressive. Treated by this, the first word of the, his practice is airway, okay? Hmm, let's take a look, okay? Yeah, I see the AGA effect from MSE. Jaws really wide. I don't, it's kind of hard to tell. Maybe, but the posterior is not open, that's for sure. A screws, I don't know, did it open? Up, oh, sorry. No skeletal change. It's all about dental expansion. So when you do this, yep, sorry, no dental expansion. All it did was push out the molars, okay? When you make someone's jaw so what? I've seen multiple patients like this. They're symptomatic, they've done treatment. You've had a great expansion. They can't breathe and they still have sleep apnea, they come to see me, what do I do? Okay, you make someone's jaw so wide, I guess we're gonna have to go to MMA because you can't use CPAP. So when you make someone's jaw so wide, it's stretching their upper lip. What am I gonna do now? Advance the maxilla? Now they're really gonna look like, as my friend would say, get him a chakit, I mean, it's simian-like, okay? Aesthetic is a real challenge when you advance someone like that, okay? So it, you, your hands are tied when you treat patients. They had a huge expa dental expansion. How about A screws? Very well known airway orthodontist, okay? Yes, this patient was expanded, okay? But reach the limit of expansion, you're done. While the patient said, you know, I've been expanding for a while and just right before I was told that I should stop, I start to feel better. I start to breathe better, I start my, my, but I'm still really symptomatic. But it's limited. It's limited by the flaring of the, the teeth, the aga effect from MSE. Okay, yes, it, he's expanded for sure. But it's, it's, it, it was limiting his expansion, right? Because he's just starting to feel better. You could see how the molars are being tilted, right? That's, you could teach me about force and vectors or what have you, okay? And that's what's going to happen, right? You apply force on the molar, on the teeth, it's going to do this. So he's still symptomatic. Another example, 31-year-old, moderate sleep apnea, cannot breathe through his nose. He was treated by this very well-known orthodontist in the, in, the, in the East Coast. He actually uh, done interviews claiming a 100% success rate in expanding his patients and never had an asymmetric expansion. This is the eighth, try multiple times, expand the patient. Now he's done expansion. Well, yes, if the suture opened up, he couldn't expand anymore. He still can't breathe through his nose, okay?
came to see me. Yes, the guy's expanded. Great. Eight screws. He's done expanding. But he still, he didn't really improve much. I expanded him. Okay. I had to chase his expansion. So the goal of expansion is to improve patient's symptoms. Okay. Who cares about intermolar width? What's, I'm being facetious, okay? So what's intermolar width? Something that we are taught in dental school that this is the perfect width? Or I challenge anyone who can show me a study that correlates the intermolar distance to breathing or sleep. I know I win because there is none. There's no correlation. It, it, I start to, it, start to, it reminds me of what people are trying to normalize cephalometric measurements when they do MMA, okay? It has no bearing whatsoever. But now every patient comes to see me. How much are you going to expand me? My intermolar width is 28. Normal is 32. Are you going to be able to expand four millimeters? I'm like, I, I don't know what to say to these people. It's just... Physiology, okay, the goal is, now if you want to do orthodontia, that's, that's the indication, great. But if you're going to improve someone's airway, you want to maximize the symptomatic improvement, okay. So, as I was expanding, so typical expansion, as I expand, there's improvement in nasal breathing, follow improvement in sleep. As I continue to expand, there's going to be continued improvement, and it's going to hit a plateau. I can't tell you when the, that plateau is. So I'm following patients three times a week, okay? They're going to tell me, yeah, I'm improved. I said, what are you do how are you doing? I'm in yeah, my breathing is getting better, but I'm starting to notice sleep improvement, et cetera, et cetera. I want to keep on going. I want to keep on going. You know, it's almost become a drug in, in someone because I'm able to breathe through my nose completely when I work out, blah, 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 okay? But there's, and you can see a large advancement on a 31-year, I mean, our large expansion, you know, through and through. This really is a mid-face expansion. You're going to get more prominent zygoma, okay? Tell patients, you expand too much? Yes, your nasal breathing. So, you know, there's, there is a sort of give and take, okay? And people say, well, you know, I want a better smile because my teeth, my jaw is too narrow, okay? You don't have to flare out the molars to, you can see there's no change, no aga change, but good expansion through and through. You could do this in adults, okay? ANS, PNS, it doesn't just happen in kids. Pure skeletal expansion, perfect example of nasal cycle. The right, the left. It's not related to expansion. It's called nasal cycle. Okay? You could achieve a wider jaw just by pure skeletal expansion. A little older, 38 year old, Large expansion, significant amount of nasal obstruction. Okay, he's still expanding. It's been eight months, I think. Okay, because he was still improving. This was, I think, one month, and this is, I don't know, seven months, something like that. How about someone who's harder? Tori, moderate sleep apnea, can't breathe through her nose. You can expand through tori. Okay, pure skeletal expansion without flaring out the teeth. Uh, she started out with age, uh, RDF, of, I think, 20, 21. I just got her study back, 8.5. Much happier. Okay? Someone harder. Man with tori. Couldn't tolerate nasal CPAP struggling. He was expanded. You can see it's a pure skeletal expansion on someone with tori. Man, he's a large expansion. Okay. <clears throat> Off of CPAP now. A little older. So this patient has severe sleep apnea. Do I think that I was going to be able to get him off of CPAP? No. But if he couldn't breathe through his nose, I want to try to improve his ability to tolerate the CPAP. Okay. So skeletal expansion through and through. Breathing much better. Lower the CPAP pressure. Much easier to tolerate. You could do this on pretty much all ages. She was on CPAP struggling, now she's off of CPAP. 
without the agat effect. Okay. Even severe sleep apnea. I wasn't going to get her off of CPAP, but I wanted to improve her nasal breathing because she was really struggling and not able to use nasal CPAP. Okay. Large ex expansion. I want to show a lot of cases because it drives me nuts whenever I go to a talk. This someone, the speaker will show one case. Okay, so I want to demonstrate that this can be done. Skeletal expansion, pure skeletal expansion. Now, not every case is perfect. It isn't. Example, 32-year-old, moderate sleep apnea, he has some periodontal problem. Okay, that's what happened. These people are hard to expand. So, what did I do? First distractor, Expanding, starting to push the molars out. I took it out, placed MSE to let the area sort of recover and place a new distractor. There's one, two, at least three distractors. I don't charge the patient. I want to get them to the, to, to the end, okay? So much better, feeling better, breathing better, sleeping better. Okay, something, someone a little different, sort of to, to, take, to hit, hit home. 48-year-old moderate sleep apnea cannot breathe, having problem breathing through her nose. I, I operated on her many, many years ago. First, she had Bell's palsy, okay, so that's why. So you can see the aging effect on someone. She, had a, she was very symptomatic. One of those patients that came to see me says, I don't care the way I look. I want to breathe better and sleep better. So, you know, if you just take account of the cephalometric, maybe I would have answered five millimeters. But she wanted to improve. So, I don't know how much I've answered, but you know, 12, something like that. Okay, you can see that. These are old x-rays. Her symptoms recurred. Her sleep, the sleep apnea gradually worsened. Okay, imagine if I only advanced her five millimeters. Would have came back to see me two years after surgery. <laughs> so you can see that she has a large, a large expansion much happier, not on CPAP, breathing better, sleeping better. She drives one and a half hours to see me three days a week for the past, I think, seven months, okay? When you take care of sleep apnea patients, these patients are vulnerable. They're easily taken because they're so compromised. Just like the first patient, some charlatan could just say, we're gonna do this for you, you're gonna feel great. You know, at the end of the day, they need to hear the truth. So, she feels much better, much happier. She's still expanding. Why? Because she's, I'm still improving. I want to maximize my improvement, okay? Not just my patients. This patient came to see me after MMA, can't breathe through his nose, and no improvement after MMA. You can see that there's a large advancement. Two months out, I said, well, you're too early. Come back in a year. He came back in a year. He's a large expansion because I was trying to chase his results, okay? The consequence of significant expansion. But he started out with fairly prominent zygoma. I'm going to finish off with this patient. 29-year-old, mild sleep apnea. Had a very large MMA. Now, that's like a 25-millimeter MMA. No symptomatic improvement. Okay, no symptomatic improvement. Let me hit that, okay, again. 25 millimeter advancement, zero improvement. Can't breathe through his nose. The guy was a good surgeon, but you have to, you know, you don't wanna be a one trick pony, basically. Okay, you have to look at the patient. I came, he came to see me, I said, you can't breathe through your nose. You need to be expanded, this is, like, I think within the first week of expansion, this is three weeks um, with expansion. Okay, you can see that he's starting, one week, three weeks, he's starting to expand. You can see the separating, the separation. I showed this patient because he's actually from France. I'm gonna see him this afternoon for a follow-up. That's the first time I did house call on an international patient. So. If you're gonna manipulate the skeleton, it's not the typical movement. You gotta do it very slow because I'm, you're manipulating the bone, okay? And these patients, you can't tell them, 
go home, turn 35 times, then come back to see me. You know, these patients need to be watched. I see a lot of dramatic asymmetric expansion, folly MSE. They go, what do I do? My, my orthodontist says, start turning back. I said, you know what? Go back to your orthodontist, okay? I've done almost 300 of these. Mean age was about 35. Suture separation. You want to open up the suture. I'm, I'm not relying on the device to open the suture. The sutures are open at the time of the surgery, okay? Mean separation between seven, four to seven millimeters. Some patients um, really want to maximize it. I have five failures that did, not, that did not achieve more than three millimeters. Let's look at a failure. This is the guy that I show, MSE. 26 year old, supposed to be easy. Okay, he failed a couple of MSEs. I expanded him. If you look at him dentally, you go, hey, you know, that's a great result, right? His arch is not wide, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I was able to expand him, but I couldn't get him beyond a couple millimeters. It just, I tried three times, okay? So I deem him a failure. But he opened up, he was better, but I, I wanted to try to improve him further. These are large expansions. You can see this pure skeletal expansion. Okay. I used to do a lot, you know, I'm an otolaryngologist and an oral surgeon. I used to do all sorts of different surgery. I only do three operations now. I fix people's noses. I do the expansion. I do the MMA. I, occasionally, if I see someone who has excess soft tissues or large tonsils, I, I said, you should get that taken out, but I don't do that surgery anymore. Why do I only do these three operations? I want consistency. If I'm gonna operate someone, I want to see results. It drives me nuts when I operate on someone that when they come back, I say, how are you doing? I feel the same. It drives me crazy when I hear that. I, if I'm gonna do something for someone, I wanna see a return, okay? And my view of airway surgery is, actually has changed with expansion. I try to head home on expansion because you as orthodontists, you know, what, what you heard from Dr. Cohen-Levy is I, I've treated a lot of kids, a lot of kids, and now, um, you know, you can change their lives, okay? So uh, these are sort of computational fluid dynamic analysis of expansion. You can see the reduction of the, of the airway resistance with expansion as well as the MMA. I, I, I stopped, I used to look at improvement of obstruction. Now I'd look at improvement of resistance. Okay, it's the resistance that causes sort of constriction, some constriction or the effort. It's the respiratory effort, you know, with your countryman Rara, okay, that's what he did. It's, it, it is not, uh, I know I was the first person to operate on someone with UARS. It was a woman that did a sub, Christian says, I want you to operate on her. Okay, did nothing. I did, it, I did the wrong operation because that was many years ago, okay? She should have had, the, uh, had an expansion. Now, it's like my last slide. This was from 2004. If you're an orthodontist, it behooves you to understand physiology, breathing, sleep, and what you're doing orthodontically because your patients are going to ask you. And you need to understand and know what you can do for them. Um, I'm just going to emphasize one thing that the prior speaker said. Now, I do less kids now because I tell people that you don't need me to do it. You could do it yourself, okay? So this paper was published. I published it on skeletal expansion on pediatric patients that already had prior RPE, okay? 18-year-old, mild sleep apnea, significant nasal obstruction, getting allergy shots, had nasal surgery, had TNA, had rapid palatal expansion. You refer this patient to a jaw surgeon, she's going to get jaw surgery, okay? But you can help her. You can help her, okay? And you don't need surgery. Place... A, I do, a, by the way, I use MSE. I don't want to make you think like I dislike MSE. You have to use to your, whatever you have, use the right 
device or surgery to treat your patient. It's not one size fits all. It isn't, okay? I just, a local anesthesia, okay? And the vector of this detractor is much better than if you apply on the teeth and where the, the MSE is however millimeter away from your palatal bone, right? It's, you know better than me, okay? You're not, no agar effect. Patients much improve, okay? Kids, I mean, I do MSE on 10-year-olds, okay? Another example, promise, last photo. So 24-year-old, 20, I did MSE on him because I felt that he, something simple, he could do it himself, okay? I thank you for your attention. I'm ready for bananas, oranges, or apples, or cheese. <laughs> thank you. It's a pleasure to be here in this really historic uh, venue. And like I said, I've never lectured at a Pope's palace. Thank you.